Hey, what's up, folks? Thanks for listening to the Aaron J. Dodson podcast brought to you by the Washington Avenue Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. This is a continuation of the study of Matthew that I've done on the Podbean channel. Today, the title of the podcast is Jesus' Authority and Correction. Before we look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 16, where Jesus cleansed the temple, I want us to keep in mind, I've repeated this often throughout this series, that the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel account written by a Jew to Jews about a Jew. Matthew is the writer. His fellow Jewish countrymen are the readers. And Jesus Christ is the subject. And Matthew's purpose is to present Jesus as the King of the Jews, the long-awaited Messiah. And in this section of Matthew, I do believe that Matthew is recording about the authority of Christ and Jesus' zeal and how Jesus was full of the zeal of God to do God's will, to use his authority to correct the corruptions among among God's people at that time. So, Jesus' authority and correction. Let's read together Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 16. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? And I want to add verse 17 also. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Now, in this text, just before this unit of Scripture is chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, the triumphal entry of Jesus, where Jesus deliberately with forethought and planning, presses the issue of his uh, messiahship and divinity upon the people by fulfilling Zechariah 9, verse 9. He comes um, into the city, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he he he, he presses the issue. He, he publicly forces the people at large to recognize that he is saying he is the Messiah and he is the fulfillment of what the scriptures had said would happen. And then, just after this, he comes into the city and, um, and when, he, when he comes into the city of Jerusalem, all the city is moved saying, who is this? And so the multitudes were saying, you know, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God And he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, etc. Take note, and you may be aware of this, but I know it wasn't until recent years, really, that I put the two together, that this has occurred once before in the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 21 is at the end of his ministry, or toward the very end. John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22, earlier, At the beginning of his public ministry, he had cleansed the temple. And then in this last week before his death, he does it a second time. Someone might say, why? Why would he do such a thing? Because, you know, sometimes people misunderstood or mistake Jesus for being some, I don't know, some lighthearted, never got excited or never had righteous indignation, some kind of fuddy-duddy. Look, Jesus had zeal. And and if you read John's account, John takes note of the word zeal and, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Psalm 69, verse 9. Let me just read John 2, verses 13, and a few verses there. 
this is at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. So it would be do us well to keep this in mind when we're considering Matthew 21. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you do to show? What sign do you show? Uh, let me get this. I can't English. What sign do you show us? Well, I, I just can't get it, folks. <laughs> you know how it is. Sometimes you're tied up. What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews mistook what he was talking about. They, they thought he was talking about the physical temple. But John says he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, I'm, I don't want to go in on John except this. John's account, that event occurred at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, chronologically. But now in Matthew chapter 21, in our continued study of Matthew and the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew records, as does Mark and Luke, that Jesus cleansed the temple yet again. You say, so what is this? This is his zeal, his authority, and the need for correction. That's what this podcast is about. The zeal of God, the zeal of God's people, the authority of God, uh, and the correction of God, and the correction of God's people. Okay? The temple in Jesus' time was to be a place of worship as it was to be from the very beginning. But instead, it had become a safe haven for the wicked. The temple had become corrupt, and that's why Jesus purged it. Now, let's consider together the contextual setting. The court of the temple had become a commercial area during feast times with merchants and customers. Matthew 21, 12 that's why Jesus was driving out those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. So animals were sold to those who came from distant towns, people that were unable to bring their own sacrifices. There was also a money exchange system in place so that people entering the city could purchase things with Jewish approved coinage. And there was an exuberant charge for this exchange. And that's why Jesus called them a den of robbers. Matthew 21, verse 13. This kind of commercialization that was going on was not a part of God's plan for his house. And you can check like Isaiah 56, verse 7, Jeremiah 7, verse 11, etc., so that's the contextual setting. You know, we're at the end of his ministry, and this had happened at the beginning. He cleansed it, but it had just gone right back in the three, three-and-a-half-year period of time, and it was corrupted again. It needed to be purged. And we see, again, the authority of Jesus. Now, here's what's amazing to me. I don't know how much you've thought into this. You probably have. That only one man was able to drive these renegades from the sacred temple is nothing short of amazing. One man. It's challenging for me, a modern, a person living in modernity now, to fully envision the powerful presence of the Messiah, the Son of God. Truly, Jesus has all authority. Matthew 28, 18. And we must listen to him. We must listen to him with respect. And when we hear him and listen to him in faith and with respect, we must obey him. On Mount Transfiguration, when Peter, James, and John were with Jesus and there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, Peter had good intentions about building the tents for each of these individuals. But a, a, a cloud overshadowed them, and the Father from heaven spoke on that mountain, and he said, 
This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Jesus has all authority. Not Moses, not Elijah, not Aaron, not Joel Osteen, not any group of elders, not any famous preacher, not any famous deacon or member of the church that you love and appreciate. Jesus has all authority. He has all power. He is in charge. He is the head of the church. Not me, not you. But then with that authority and with his zeal, he makes corrections. Let's consider the correction from Jesus. So, the Jews were guilty of not only irreverence, but greed. That's why Jesus said, you've made this place a den of thieves. In our day and time, it's not a whole lot different. Many professing Christians abhor any teaching or preaching or action that corrects those who are in sin or error. And when people who abide by the authority of Christ as detailed in the Scriptures stand up and speak and teach to people who claim to do better, to know better, to be the people of God. I'm not talking about chiding people who don't know or who don't care or have no access to the Word of God, etc. I'm talking about people who are supposed to be leaders among professed God's people. There's a problem if we abhor correction among religious leaders, professing Christians, But yet, if I or others stand up and teach and preach publicly, even if I do it with the best of intent, there's going to be someone who says, well, that's not loving. I don't like that kind of correction. Jesus didn't do that. We need to love people like Jesus did. Folks, Jesus loved these people. That's why he did it. We are to be loving in this life, but that doesn't mean that we're to withhold preaching the whole truth. Paul said, I didn't shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, verse 27. And just recently I had a conversation with one of my good elders and it surrounded the fact that a congregation does not have to have false doctrine taught to it in order to apostatize. It just has to have a preacher who does not teach the entire counsel of God. He does not warn. He does not teach the judgments and the condemnations of God. Folks, Paul did, Acts 20, verse 20 and verse 27. We are to love, and that means to preach the whole truth. It doesn't mean that you must hold your mouth right perfectly or that you are to shun to declare the whole truth because we want to be loving. We don't want to run anyone off. No, we're to be loving by rebuking those who are in error and sin. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says that. And that's the thing. We get, this, we get this false idea of kindness in our mind. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Earnestly contend for the faith, Jude verse 3. Somebody steps in, though, and said, but Ephesians 4.15 says to speak the truth in love. Folks, that's not the way the preacher holds his mouth or how loud or how soft he speaks. If it is, then how soft is soft and how soft are we, and how loud is too loud and how loud are we supposed to go? You see how, you see how silly it gets outside of the ramifications of Scripture? The phrase speaking the truth in love is an ellipsis where Paul implies the subject of the context the truth, which is able to prevent people from being swayed to and fro by various doctrines, which is what Paul is discussing in the context. The phrase is an ellipsis, folks. He's implying the subject. We're to speak the truth in love of the truth. It's obvious that Jesus corrected people in the temple because of his love for his Father, Luke 2, 49. And also because of his love for the people involved. Yeah, Jesus loved them, and that's why he told them the things that they needed to hear. 
Revelation 3, 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Jesus corrected folks. And he did it because he loved his Father, he loved the truth, and he loved their souls. And we're to follow in this teaching, not merely because he did it, but also because he has taught us to reprove, rebuke, and exhort, 2 Timothy 4, 2. And yes, we need to preach with, you know, usefulness in our preaching. We don't want to purposely be offensive, but we want to purposely preach Jesus, the whole counsel of God, even the parts that are less popular or are not popular at all. So here's what we have so far. We've got Jesus' authority. We've, we've got the correction that Jesus gives. But here's one thing I wanted to point out. With this power, all power, and his and the, and the respect that deity demands. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew 21. Jesus is very bold to drive these people out and to state the Bible says or it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. I mean, that, that's what we think of as sharp. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Notice the care of Jesus. Immediately after rebuking those involved in this commercialization of the temple, many with infirmities came to Jesus in the temple, and Jesus healed them. And this shows that Jesus handled himself in a respectful way. We don't think, I don't think for a moment, Jesus acted like a hateful lunatic. Because no one would have gone to a hateful lunatic to receive a blessing. But let's be careful not to call preaching the whole truth and the seriousness of sin being a hateful lunatic. And I think that's where we are in our society and sadly even in the culture sometimes of the congregations of the church. People are just afraid to preach the truth and to even raise the voice and say, folks, sin is sin and sin damns the soul to hell. And I'm going to elucidate some of the sins that Scripture clearly calls sin. And we cannot practice these things if we expect to be right with God. There's heaven, there's hell at stake. You know, for a lot of people, if you say that, they disagree with you. You're not caring, you're not loving, you're not kind, etc., on and on. But Jesus was not a hateful lunatic. Instead, he was the most loving person that ever lived. Keep that in mind when you read his strong rebuke of these brash sins of the professed people of God. Okay, got to keep the context in mind. Jesus is not going off on someone who's never heard the gospel, never had a sit-down Bible study with someone that's a member of the church that knows the Bible. He's dealing with people who profess to be the people of God, who boldly proclaim and teach and practice the error that God does not accept but rejects. Keep that in mind, the care of Jesus. Finally, let's consider together in this the reaction by the chief priests. And here's the thing. Seeing Jesus' actions and the children chanting, Hosanna to the Son of David, the rulers were infuriated, according to Matthew 21, verse 15. And Jesus, with his yes, acknowledges that he is fully aware of what they are affirming about him, that he is the Son of David. He is Messiah. He even quotes scripture to explain that children had declared, these children had declared what was right, what was true regarding his identity and his authority and power. That's verse 16. Jesus says, yes. <laughs> Their question is, don't you hear what they're saying? You know, I'm, folks, I'm not the Messiah. Never have been, never will be. I'm but a grateful servant to teach and preach God's Word. I, I can see cases and scenarios and situations where a man of God 
He is preaching the truth. He loves the truth. He loves the Lord, and he loves lost souls, and he's warning people about the damning power of sin and the damning power of false religion. And yet some member of the church who claims to love the Lord is over there cutting his wheels out from under him because he's complaining or she's complaining and opining about the way he holds his mouth when he preaches. When all otherwise in his life you can see by his, by his attitude and his tenor and his behavior and demeanor, he loves God, he loves the truth, and he cares for souls that are lost. Look at the reaction of these chief priests. They're infuriated at the way Jesus handled. You know, there are some people, they just get infuriated with the way I or others preach the truth. You get fired up. You get zealous about the truth. And immediately someone points the finger. Well, you're not sinlessly perfect. Folks, I've never claimed to be sinlessly perfect. I don't personally know anyone who has ever claimed that at, besides, besides Jesus, which I didn't personally know him. You, you get my point. I'm, I'm talking about people in my time that I personally know. I'm sure there are some who have said that or have truly acted that way. But to preach the whole truth with zeal is not to claim sinless perfection. It's not to belittle people that don't agree with you is to emphasize the truth and give God the glory. Now, look, there's different settings. There's different contexts. What I want people to, what I want those that hear this to think and to, to, to think about, there, there, there's not a list in Scripture that like, like this cookie-cutter model for every scenario, every situation, every sermon, every lesson, every conversation you have with an individual or two people or three people or a group of people, there's not this cookie-cutter list of things that you can say or can't say or must say or not say, except for don't preach error, preach the truth, nothing but the truth. Love the Lord, love the truth, love the lost, do your job. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's a summary of it. I stand behind everything I just said. It's, it's not complicated. Folks, it's easy to criticize other people. And I, 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 I realize there are some people, the way they carry themselves, they do act like they're better than other people. They won't ever admit a fault. And they speak to people like the others around them are total idiots. I, I, I get it. There is a way to handle yourself and a way to not handle yourself. I get that. But when a person is otherwise caring and useful, and, and let me just add, like hearing someone on the Internet one or two or three times is different than being around someone a lot and actually taking in a lot of who they are and what they say. Let's be let's be quick to let's be slow. Let's be quick to be patient. Let's be slow to make judgments about people. I, I see people online and, and otherwise, you know, I don't listen to that guy anymore, a bunch of garbage. And and they don't even really know that person. They just heard four or five lessons or one or two lessons or or they think they know, but they haven't seen the good that person has done. They haven't seen the humility and the usefulness and kindness of that person, etc. Let's let's just be careful to not critique our brethren so much. Okay, I'm I'm off my soapbox, but you know, this all comes into the fact that Jesus spoke with authority. I I, I don't think when Jesus I, I, I personally I'm gonna go with, I'm gonna go so far as to say when Jesus came in there with a whip of cords in John 2. And when he came in there at the end of his ministry, which it doesn't mention the whip of cords the second time, but when he comes in there, I don't see Jesus saying in this soft, unurgent voice, it is written, um, my house shall be called a house of praise. Um, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but um, you you guys, um, y'all have made it you know, kind of like a den of thieves. I, I'm not saying you have, but it's possible you have, and you want to be careful. And I, I envision Jesus raising his voice, speaking with authority. I, I envision Jesus speaking sternly with seriousness. This is serious. My house, it's written in Scripture. My house shall be called a house of prayer.
prayer. But you, that's personal. That's pointing the finger. Some people say, just preach generally. That'll get her done. Really? But you, you have made it a den of thieves. Now, I keep in mind when I preach, if I, if I literally point my finger, I have three pointing back at me. And, and I know James chapter 3, verse 1. I, I, I am well aware of this, and it, and it scares me to the point of being as careful as I possibly can and being serious about the mandates of God for my own personal life. James chapter 3, verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we, we teachers, shall receive a stricter judgment. I keep that in mind when I preach and teach. And I also keep in mind 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. Take heed to yourself. That was written to the evangelist Timothy. Pay attention to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So my job as a teacher is to pay attention to my own life. I'm not to be a busybody. The Word of God, however, meddles in my life. And when preaching and teaching is done with reprove, rebuke, exhort, and be patient, it's specific so that people don't walk away going, oh yeah, I'm fine, I'm okay in my sin. They walk away knowing, I'm not okay, and they walk away knowing God wants me to change. I have the ability to change. It is my decision, and God has given his best to motivate me to change. And, you know, all that's part of teaching and preaching. All right, I've said, maybe I've said too much. Jesus' authority and correction. You've got this contextual setting. You've got the authority of Jesus the correction that comes from Jesus, the care of Jesus, and the reaction of the chief priest. I, what, what are we doing in, in our own context? In the congregations where we are, when needed, are we reproving and rebuking? Are we making corrections to our own lives and then in our teaching for others to soak in so that they can make the changes that God wants them to make do we care for people around us? People that are in need of the word. People that are in need of maybe even other spiritual things or physical things in their own lives. How do we react to the preaching and teaching of the truth? Do we love and support that person and help them? Or do we put a wall up? Are, are we one of those individuals who we attend all the church services, but we don't want the word to take root in our hearts? Instead, we get mad at the messenger. And so we put a wall up. And with our face, we smile. We say, hey, good to see you. But deep down, we say, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have it for him. I don't, I don't care for our preacher, our elders, our Bible class teacher that really comes down with the Word of God. Folks, we need to love and appreciate those that teach the Word of God. And as preachers and teachers, we need to examine our own lives, and we need to live right, and we need to be careful. We don't need to be purposely offensive. We just need to be purposefully like Jesus. Teach the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Love and serve with the best attitude possible to draw sinners to God, to help people in the process of conversion. Well, Jesus has all authority and Jesus corrected. We need to listen to his authority and we need to listen to his correction. Thank you so much. For listening to the Aaron J. Dodson podcast, which is a work of the Washington Avenue Church of Christ. We have services on Sunday at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and 5 p.m., and on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. If you're in our area, we would love for you to be our guest. Here's why. We believe in what we're doing, and we believe that what we're doing, to the best of our ability, is what the Lord wants us to do. We acknowledge our shortcomings and our need for learning and growth and for God's grace and forgiveness. But we believe in what we're doing because it's the Lord's work. It's the Lord's will. And we, we want you to be a part of it. So, so if you listen to this, you're, you're hearing this, and you're thinking about finding a church or looking for a church, hey, look no farther. Come and see. Come be with us. Thanks for listening. God bless, and I'll catch you next time.